Hello, uh, this is Reed Armstrong again for the International Catholic University. Our subject is the sacred in art. This is our eighth and final lecture. It will be on the Baroque and the Counter-Reformation. We started with the idea of the Greeks and cosmos in our first lesson, how natural reason could bring forth a coherent view of the universe. Our second lecture was on Christian art, East and West. Our third lecture was on universal symbolism, which we can use to understand and try to decipher the <coughs> sometimes hidden meanings of pictures. Our fourth lecture was on the medieval art from monasticism up through the beautiful cathedrals of the 1300s in Paris and surroundings. Our fifth lecture was the Franciscan Revolution in Italy and its humanist uh, effect on the arts. Our sixth lecture was Fra Angelico, the genius and saint, the great Dominican. Our seventh lecture was the uh, high renaissance and the influence of Neoplatonic Gnosticism. And our final lecture, as I say, will be the Baroque, uh, a period highly connected to the Counter-Reformation in, in the Catholic tradition, and that will be our final lecture, as I say. I'm going to read a brief introduction, as I have before, to try and give you kind of the historical and philosophical background of the period we're discussing, then we'll move on to some slides. Uh, simply said, the so-called Baroque period has been one of the most difficult periods for secular art historians to, uh, to explain. The Webster's Dictionary definition does not help. It conjures up the generally pejorative view of the Baroque phenomenon held by 19th century and many 20th century critics, mainly Protestant secular humanist commentators. For Webster, the Baroque relates to the art of the 17th century and is marked by its generally extravagant forms and elaborate and sometimes grotesque ornamentation, and specifically also in architecture by dynamic opposition and use of curved and plastic figures in music by bizarre by improvisation, contrasting effects and powerful tensions, and in literature by complexity of form and bizarre, ingenious, and often ambiguous imagery. Even for a dictionary definition, one is struck by an overarching sort of incomprehension, if not hostility, to the subject defined. Even the word itself, baroque, is said to derive from a Portuguese word meaning, well, barroco in Portuguese, meaning an uneven pearl a clear allusion to something intrinsically beautiful but containing uh, deviations or perhaps even some tragic flaw. Uh, we can not here get into the music or literature described by Mr. Webster. However, even in this uh, brief dictionary entry, one gives one idea as to the concept of what Baroque was on a broad scale in a general movement. There was a 17th century artistic movement. Uh, to continue with the overview of the period, one may start with the formalist or structuralist school made up of critics and historians who view all art in terms of pure aesthetics or the simple arrangement of line, shape, and color of any given work of art. As some of an aside, uh, we must realize that virtually all students of art and art history in this country as well as England and Germany were taught to view all visual art from this perspective from the early 19th century right up through the mid-1980s. The formalist school exemplified by such a critic as Henrik Wolfson, Wolflin, saw the Baroque as a switch from the classical ideal of the Renaissance in purely stylistic terms as a swing from plain to recession, linear to painterly, clearness to unclearness, without trying the least to determine why such changes should have taken place at all. Others, such as Erwin Panofsky of the warburg Corto uh, circle, uh, who we mainly students of the High Renaissance, were totally enamored of the Neoplatonism and simply wrote off the Baroque as lordly racket. Yet others have seen the Baroque as a flight from the severe regulation and regimentation of the High Renaissance. Um, they'd say a more naturalistic view in the arts, a forerunner of modern art. They would quote Rembrandt as saying, one must be guided by nature, not rules. They'd also point uh, to the proliferation of landscape painting and still life painting as proof of their argument. All of this is true to an extent, but as Rupert Martin 
um, historian has noted, this naturalism of the Baroque was far from removed, was, was very far removed from the 19th century art of nature painting and from its classical antecedents. For Baroque painters combined their naturalism with, a, with moralizing and allegory. And I think we're getting this to the crux of the matter here, that Baroque art was not merely a shift in technical modes of expression, but a paradigm shift in how reality ought to be viewed. What we call the Baroque is fundamentally a product of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. It's a manifestation of a belief system akin to any other artistic magnification as an imaginative outpouring of a reigning philosophy or religious point of view. We have seen the classical Greek ordering of the cosmos displayed in art, the celestial visions of Byzantium displayed in art, the Christian humanism of St. Francis and Dominic displayed in art, the Baroque is the spirit of the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1562, displayed in art. Whereas the reformers, Luther, Calvin, as well as the other, their followers had denounced the world itself as having been corrupted through original sin and that man, as totally corrupt also, deformed in both intellect and will, the Catholic Church affirmed dogmatically at the Council of Trent that the world itself made by God was good and that man, though wounded in both intellect and will, was indeed capable of good work on the natural order according to his nature and on the supernatural order according to God's grace. It all hinged on this concept of grace. Luther claimed that corrupt man uh, was so awful that he had to put on grace as an external cover for his sinful nature and thus become agreeable to God. And the church said, no, that grace worked from within by activating <coughs> the soul to faith and good works. This is not a theological lecture. But these two distinct visions spark two very different worldviews, especially in regard to the arts. The Protestants, mainly in Northern Europe, England, and North America, considered the material world a slippery place indeed. Human existence was concerned only with the Bible and business, i.e. bourgeois culture. While the Catholics, mainly in Southern Europe, Austria, and Bavaria, and South America, were content to celebrate all creation, a la Francis and Dominic, bathed in the light of God's providence. That's Baroque culture. In many ways, the Protestant revolt was a rejection of the incarnational theology blessed at the Second Council of Nicaea and exemplified by Francis and Dominic, and a return to the Hebraic view that God was God and the world was the world and ne'er the twain shall meet. I should like to quote here to this effect from historian Christopher Dawson. The Hebraic tradition was characteristic of Protestant culture and has often been regarded, e.g. by Matthew Arnold, for the anti-humanist, Philistine character of middle-class culture in England and America. It was naturally strongest among the sects whose intellectual life was nourished on the Bible and the Bible only. But even representatives of the high Protestant culture, like Milton, there is a hard core of unassimilated Hebraism, which is in conflict with the humanist education in which, even in Lesterman, produced a sharp dualism between religion and culture. It was this dualism which prevented the development of religious drama and art in the 17th century and caused that partial secularization of culture which destroyed the medieval unity of religious and social life. In Catholic Europe, this was not so. As I have said, continues Dawson, the Baroque culture was not confined to the scholastic and the men of letters. It permeated the life of the people. And as a whole, through the religious art, music, and drama, which continued to play the same part in the Baroque world as it had played in the Middle Ages. In summary, the Protestant bourgeois ethic produced a society of godly merchants, shopkeepers, and craftsmen who worked hard and spent little, who regarded themselves as God's elect and who were ready to fight to the death against any attempt of the king, pope, or bishop to interfere with their religion or their business. The maxims of the bourgeois are, according to Dawson, Honesty is the best policy, do as you would be done by, and the greatest good for the greatest numbers. This was a str in strong contrast to the rich communal life of Baroque Europe with its external magnificence and its internal poverty. In its palaces and its monasteries, its saints and its beggars, the Baroque spirit 
lives in and for the triumphal moment of creative ecstasy. Its maxims are, again according to Dawson, all for love and the world well lost, or the Spanish mystics, nada, nada, nada. These two worldviews are totally antithetical and resulted, as we know, in the terrible wars of religion. Be that as may, where Protestants, again, in their Hebraic zeal, smashed all the graven images they could find, uh, the Baroque uh, princes and prelates went on making works of art. Now, a caveat here, this is not to say that Protestants produced no worthwhile art during the 17th century and beyond. Not all, Purit uh, not all Protestants uh, were Puritan zealots bent on a Manichaean war against the world. Large segments of the Lutheran community and, of course, the Anglicans who rejected the authority of Rome maintained a common European heritage, of, uh, especially of the imagination, which was difficult to break. Even the Cal Calvinists uh, of the Netherlands, much like the ancient iconoclasts of Constantinople, allowed the great Rembrandt to paint portraits of themselves, much as the Emperor Leo did in Constantinople, but did not want any portraits of our Lord. Now this is an oversimplified uh, introduction and it is certainly in no ways meant to upset the ecumenical dialogue as we know it today where both these two views are trying to f come together to form a, a truly Christian culture. Uh, however, it sets off a historic time period of why and how there, be, there was a Northern European dearth of art in a Catholic sense, I mean, portraying uh, Christ and his saints, and why in Southern Europe, I mean, the, the saints and the mystery of salvation was still preached through art. We're going to start out with uh, St. Peter's, as we dealt with in the um, <coughs> High Renaissance. St. Peter's uh, is the center of Catholicism, and it was here that the Catholic revival, the Counter-Reformation, uh, started. It is also here at St. Peter's, we must remember, uh, where we had this vision in the 16th century, according to Egidio da Viterbo, of the 10th age of man and the glorious uh, reign of Rome under the papacy. Now, it was this vision of a, of a temporal rule that inspired the popes to try to uh, build the most beautiful cathedral in the world in honor and glory of Christ and his church. And this is where the popes went out and uh, sought money to, for the building of this great temple, which sparked Luther and his zeal to tack up his 95 theses for the theory of indulgences. As we know that uh, if you gave money for the building of St. Peter's, the Pope promised an indulgence or an amelioration of your sins. And this is within in Catholic dogma still today, that it is the, not the money, it is the sacrifice. If you are sacrificing yourself, whether it is money or work or time, for a noble effort for the glory, glory of God through his church, it, the church is absolutely within its rights as what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, to grant indulgences. Well, anyway, it was here at the, at St. Peter's that the whole thing started, and Bernini probably is the most famous of the uh, architects and uh, sculptors of the Baroque period, which we've explained in our introduction as this Catholic uh, concept of the Counter-Reformation. Here we see his uh, facade put over the, uh, the Roman, it, it's a kind of gingerbreading up, not really ginger, but it's, it's a kind of smoothing over and naturalizing of a very stark facade that had been there before. Uh, next, please. And, of course, we all know Bernini's uh, columns coming out, the, the square, we've kept it round, it's not quite round, it's an ellipse, of St. Peter's, where people gather, this is looking down from the top of St. Peter's into, into the piazza below, uh, where pilgrims gather. Gather. Now, Bernini was a devout Catholic, a family man, a very jovial and, uh, I would say, Baroque man himself, who loved life and loved art and loved his God and loved his church. And these arms, according to these uh, pillars, were built uh, low enough so that people could be see over them to see the, the towering Vatican above uh, the city of Rome. But more, often, more importantly, Bernini himself said that they were the arms of Mother Church reaching out to confirm 
the Catholic faithful in their faith to reach out to encourage the heretics to return and to even to embrace the agnostics. So it is a very uh, Catholic and iconological statement, the arms of Holy Mother Church. What a beautiful idea. Next, please. Bernini's well-known Baldacino on the altar of St. Peter's is typical and archetypal of the Baroque. These are uh, what we call Solomonic columns, these curved columns. They're not stiff, they're natural. Everything in nature moves in circles and swerves, and they're decorated with leaf-like uh, um, branches and vines. It is nature being uh, infused with grace. Remember the whole Catholic idea of the Catholic Reformation in counter to Luther's idea that we're so evil we have to put on the armor of grace because we still remain wretched. We're never justified except by, the, by Christ's blood and grace. But for the kind of grace comes in, so you have this tremendous light coming in. There's always light in the Baroque churches coming in and everything is gilded inside, illuminated by this white light. In the Gothic cathedral saw this idea of a heavenly uh, paradise on earth was through the breaking up into infinite variety of the light coming through the stained glass windows. Here the variety, in the Baroque period there's a change, the same idea really, that you have nature represented in the infinite variety of nature, the, the infinite variety being in God's mind, in its actuality the world is not infinite, but that this is infused with grace, that nature uh, is not evil in itself. But in the, next please. We see the cross, the crucifix, again, it's all infused with this light coming down, bathing into nature through the crucifixion, through the salvic uh, victory of Christ on the cross. Next, please. The best known uh, sculpture of Bernini is the St. Teresa and the transverberation. The transverberation is that St. Teresa received the wounds of Christ on her heart much as St. Francis received the wounds of Christ on his hands and the stigmata, that the transverberation means that St. Teresa, in a moment of ecstasy, of, of love of Christ, Christ came and impressed his own wounds for, of identification on her heart. And I know in the Catholic tradition, uh, modern day people, we think this is perhaps a little bit gross, but her heart is conserved in Avila, in a jar, in a reliquary. Remember that those who die in Christ live in Christ. We covered this previously. So her heart is there preserved uh, and you can see, in fact, the scars of these wounds of Christ. Now here we see, again, bathed in light coming down from above, this moment. It is a technical, I mean, tour de force uh, of marble carved, and it's weighed up, you think this weighs tons, but it is this moment of divine grace, this uh, coming into nature, and in this case, and in a very extreme way, of the uh, piercing of uh, St. Teresa of Avila's heart, with this divine grace and unification with Christ. Next, please. In the Jesuit church, uh, Father Poso's painting, Jesuit uh, priest painted this, uh, it's, typical, it's, it's later on, it's 18th century, but it's typical of this Roman Baroque. I'm going to stick with Rome here for a moment. Uh, if this is seen in Rome. This is what's called trompe l'oeil, that you're fooling the eye. The ceiling is painted and joins up with the actual uh, architecture of the church. There's an architecture that's painted into the ceiling, uh, <coughs> and the two are blended together totally harmoniously. Now, this is not just, I mean, an artistic uh, achievement to be able to do this. The, the idea behind this is, again, totally counter-Reformation and Jesuitical of St. Ignatius. We're going to get to him in a moment. Uh, but that the glorious, I mean, these are the missions of the Jesuits, that heaven at the top, the light of God, the heaven, comes down in and levels and gradations and fills nature. That the, uh, the celestial comes down and imbues nature with a new special glory through the, uh, the Christian mystery of the death and resurrection of Christ. Next, please. The... Uh, Judo Reni's uh, idea of the aurora, this is again a ceiling painting, uh, it is aurora, the dawn, but as a Catholic allegory, it, I mentioned in the introduction that there are al many allegories painted in the Baroque that have a Christian message. It is that the aurora, just as the dawn goes across the sky, aurora is dawn, goes across the sky every day, the repetition, the daily repetition of dawn, there is the daily repetition of the infusion of God's grace into men's souls 
through the sacraments and prayer as, uh, and into nature itself where there are men of goodwill. Next, please. Now, Caravaggio is considered an essential painter of the Baroque. It's a different idea than we saw of Bernini, uh, but it is again this idea of light coming into the darkness, which was the, the Counter-Reformation idea that it comes into. This is Matthew receiving the call from Jesus, and Caravaggio painted very, very natural people, very normal people. He, he was a very ordinary man, in ordinary in the sense he was a very natural man that he haunted taverns and he got in duels and he was not, I mean, a terribly pious man. He had his ups and downs. He went to the monastery, monastery and got out again, a, a normal human being, but a Catholic. Uh, but here we see the light coming through Christ's finger coming down to St. Matthew. It is through Christ that this light comes into the world. It doesn't cover each person, but it points to and illuminates this grace must be come in. It knocks at the door. This grace will come into your soul. I will come in and sup with you, as our Lord says. Next with you. Next, please. His descent from the cross, again, probably done from some of his buddies uh, uh, from the tavern as models, uh, but it makes no difference. The, it is this Baroque idea that even people in taverns can be sanctified by grace, that the light is coming down and illuminating this whole uh, thing, that there is a darkness in the world, but grace illuminates this darkness to, to bring forth acts of good work. And uh, it is, I mean, a very, very fine painting indeed. Next, please. In the Counter-Reformation style. Now, even Rembrandt, who was a Protestant, a Calvinist, I mean, officially, he wanted to become a Mennonite, but they wouldn't accept him. Uh, he was imbued with this uh, Catholic tradition, the, the Roman style, and has a very, <coughs> excuse me, Counter-Reformation uh, view to art. Now, remember, the Calvinist fathers didn't want um, pictures of any of these religious scenes. This was, I mean, uh, against the, the commandment. You cannot have graven images. So Rembrandt was following his inner sort of Catholic imagination and soul when he did this. And he's one of the greatest painters of all time. Whatever, whatever religion he was, I mean, uh, God bless him. He's a, a, one of the glories of human history. But his idea of light coming in and illuminating nature. Next, please. The same is in, in his wonderful painting of the descent from the cross, uh, which is the National Gallery in Washington. The, the great darkness here, but the Christ bathed in light, and the light of Christ, there's two focuses of light in here. There is a light coming down, a natural light coming down, illuminating Christ. Then the light comes out from Christ. That the Christ is, is, is lit from above, from God, then the light comes from Christ and illuminates his blessed mother. That there, this, it is through Christ that this illumination, that this grace comes into the world. And it's uh, a tremendously powerful painting because we have the Blessed Mother here, not as any Neoplatonic archetype of the celestial Venus, but, I mean, a wounded mother. I mean, she is going through the same pain and this, this almost, I mean, a, a very Catholic view, I mean, of Christ, uh, Christ and his mother united in this moment. Through your own heart a sword will pass. Next, please. Rubens' crucifixion is delightfully exuberant. He was an ambassador of the, of the Netherlands to Spain. He was a very wealthy man. He collected art himself. And he puts the crucifixion here as a jumble of humanity and this crucifixion as taking place within the real world, within, within humanity, within the hustle and bustle of everyday life, people going and coming. There is this central mystery of Christ which illuminates all. Next, please. Yeah, this is a, it's a work of artisanry, but uh, I think it exemplifies the Baroque spirit, I mean, to a T. It is a statue about 20 inches high of St. George in Bavaria, uh, ordered by the Wittelbach kings of Bavaria. It is of St. Uh, George slaying the dragon, and it cost 300 gold florins. At that time, that was enough to field an army. Now, these were the protectors of the Catholic faith at the time, and instead of hiring a bunch of soldiers, they made this symbolic image that has something like 36 40-carat diamonds, 2,300 small diamonds, 430 uh, rubies, 36 emeralds, and I don't know how many pearls. It's all set in gold. I mean, today, a king's ransom. 
But it is a symbol of this idea because St. George, we've seen him before in iconography and we saw a prototype in the Greeks, is the symbol of man slaying the dragon. And in this case, it is the dragon of Protestantism or the revolt against Holy Mother Church. And remember that St. George slays the dragon and saves the maiden. The maiden is the one to be saved. And the maiden in this case uh, is Holy Mother Church. It is Mary Church. It, that, here is a symbol of the royalty willing to spend all its uh, efforts to save the church. Next, please. Uh, Karlsruhe, the uh, Royal Kaiser Kapell, this Germanic Baroque uh, continued on. And you'll see that again this nature, these filigreed ceilings, that it, nature is good. It's not stiff or rectangular. Uh, uh, but it's always bathed in light. The, the light of God will illuminate and save the world. Next, please. Again, all right, this I believe in Prague. You have these Solomonic columns here of nature. And again, bathed in light. It's not a very good slide. Let's move on. Again, this uh, Germanic Baroque... Uh, of light coming in and illuminating a very ornate interior where uh, nature is renewed in grace. Next, please. I mentioned St. Ignatius before, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Company of Jesus in 1634 in Spain, before, just before the uh, Council of Trent, and we see it's an anonymous painting, but here is the illumination coming in to illuminate St. Ignatius. And his chasuble here is of uh, nature. Now the whole idea of the Ignatian reforms were the spiritual exercises with a tremendous emphasis on the use of the imagination. That it wasn't just the book, that all the senses, uh, oler, oir, all in Spanish, to hear, to smell, all of these things must be incorporated to move men to good works, both in uh, politics and in morality. This is, I mean, a very Jesuit idea that one needed all the senses, and this is where, I mean, the Baroque art differs so much from its Protestant uh, counterpart, the bourgeois counterpart. And as this uh, Ignatian spirit, which was the spearhead behind the Counter-Reformation, of uh, he was, he, as we had Francis and Dominic, um, as two saints raised by God to destroy the, the Manichaean world haters of their time, Ig Ig Ignatius comes up and uh, is the saint, the paladin of God in destroying the, the, the world haters of the uh, Calvinist uh, attack on God's creation. Next, please. Now, El Greco is mainly considered in the secular art histories a mannerist, but he is very much a part of this Counter-Reformation. This is painted in 1600, at the beginning of the uh, 17th century, of the Cardinal Inquisitor. And it's a very interesting point from a, a Catholic point of view. El Greco, of course, is Greek painting in Spain. And the ecclesial power in Spain at this time, that this, the church was really a, at an apogee in Spain in the 17th century. And people, it was one of these enigmatic pictures like the Giorgione we saw, uh, and people, what does it mean? Actually, again, it's, it's quite simple. What you have here is uh, the face of the Grand Inquisitor, which seems very stern to the onlooker. I don't know if you, the onlooker can see this in the slides, but in the museum, it's a very fierce face. But if you look closely, there are very sad and loving eyes behind these glasses. There are two hands down here. The left hand of severity is clenched, the right hand of, of mildness and compassion is loose. So this Inquisition has two sides, just as, the, as in life. There is severity, there is justice, and there is compassion. These are expressed in his hand. This is part of the Inquisition. There are no feet touching the floor. <coughs> the wind, the Ruah, the breath of God blows him. Uh, tessellated floor, the squares, black and white squares, good and evil, uh, and a note down here on the floor saying that he is following what he must do. This is the tradition, these are the orders. Uh, 
a wonderful icon, I mean, of the Counter-Reformation and the power of the church. Next, please. This is an icon of Queen Elizabeth. I don't, I'm, we're not going to be discussing the Protestant Reformation or the, what went on in England. There was, not much, there was no religious art done in England during this period. But this is, again, an icon that can be deciphered. It was in the property of Lord Cecil, one of the great enemies of the church and promoters of uh, Queen Elizabeth. She holds in her right hand the rainbow, the celestial beam, and on her left arm she has the serpent, the telluric serpent. So she, the skies and earth are combined in her person. Uh, she wears the crescent moon. Of, uh, she is Astrea to these people. She is the, the queen. All things are embodied in this queen. It is the putting together of all virtues. She has eyes all over her robe. She is uh, omniscient. This is an apotheosis of the royal English house that was, I say, held in, in, the, in the Tudor household. Uh, we'll just leave Elizabeth on her crone, a throne here and we'll move back to the bourgeois culture. Next, please. Now, admittedly, a lot of the wealth for the production of this Baroque art came from the Indies, who came from South America, the mines of the Indies. <coughs> and, uh, of course, the Leyenda Negra, the black legend, says I mean, all the Catholic Church did when they went to the, uh, to the Indies was loot of gold and silver. The fact that they brought the Catholic faith uh, is irrelevant, but it, it is very relevant. But this is St. Isidore of Seville in the, ca uh, in the Cathedral of Seville, uh, this picture was taken in 1992 during the World's uh, Fair over there. I took this picture. This is St. Isidore the Bishop. And this is all, uh, there's a full-size, life-size figure, and it's all solid silver and gold. I mean, this is the tirar la casa por la ventana, throw the house out through the window. This Baroque spirit, live for the moment, uh, anything to the glory of the saints, which was, again, this idea of the Counter-Reformation. The saints are worthy because they are members of the mystical body of Christ. They have died in Christ. They are alive in Christ. And we will glorify our saints. Next, please. Uh, this monstrance in the, ca uh, the, uh, the Cathedral of Seville, again, uh, in the 17th century. I don't know whether one can see the size of the people down here. There's little tiny people down here. I mean, this is, again, the Counter-Reformation insistence on the validity of the Eucharist. Christ is there, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and you better believe it because we're going to put this in a 40-foot solid silver monstrance, and the people can come in here and venerate the, uh, the sacrament. Next, please. This is just a close-up to show, I mean, just the tremendous... Uh, artisan work here, this, uh, this enormous piece. It's not, it's not just in poured silver. This is handcrafted with tremendous loving care. I mean, it is I mean, this Eucharistic splendor that uh, drove these people at the time. Next, please. Again from the cathedral in Seville, uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola done by Martinez Montañez, one of the great uh, Spanish sculptors. We hear very little of this Spanish uh, sculptural school because it's polychromed art and our tradition as the bourgeois culture rather than the Baroque culture came here to North America. Uh, one doesn't hear much about what was done in this Baroque. I say the, the historians of our time kind of don't, they don't understand it. It's not that they don't like it, it's just that they don't understand it. That the idea of saints and sanctity and the canonizable saint is, is something that's just foreign to their imagination. A tremendous work of art, the body language of the saint, the gesture, there's a certain tightness, a certain rigidity uh, for the self-control of the saint, yet there is a naturalness and warmth uh, to the saint. There was one time he had a cross in his hand, of course, his head is turned looking at the cross. Tremendous sense of uh, gesture and theatrical, not overdone, just enough. Tremendous, again, as in Fra Angelico, how he could paint Saints Montagnes. We know very little of these people. As a matter of fact, in his art history, the less you know about a, uh, an artist, probably the better, because usually what comes down to us in history are the peccadillos of the artist, not their sanctity. But this was a time of great faith. This was the time of St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross. That Spain was a living, burning uh, cradle of faith at this time. Next, please. It's not to say there were no sinners. There were always sinners. Again, this is the close-up of the face of, of St. Ignatius in a kind of mystic reverie, yet he's also a very practical man, which I think shows through. Next, please. Velasquez, well-known uh, portrait of Christ. It's, it's curious that Velasquez is one of the Spanish uh, Baroque painters who we do hear about 
Maybe it's because he was not terribly uh, a religious man. He was more of a, a secular humanist. It's still a great painting. Um, some people say he painted the hair over the eye because the, that eye wasn't turning out right, so he just put the hair over it and said, forget about it. Uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's a great painting. One can use this, of course, for one's devotion. One sees it on holy cards every, everywhere. Next, please. I far prefer Zurbaran's picture of the Christ. Again, the dark background illuminated by grace, uh, the figure of Christ here. This is in the Chicago Museum. The first time I saw this walking up the stairs, I was overpowered by the spiritual nature of this painting. Zurbaran was a painter of the monastic uh, life. He was obviously himself a man of tremendous devotion and captures here the agony and the dignity of Christ at the same moment, at the moment of his death. Uh, artistically speaking, the wonderful uh, drapery here, uh, but it's very definite this idea of light coming in and illuminating grace, illuminating nature. Next, please. This is Carmona's crucifix uh, from the Valladolid Museum in northern Spain. There's a museum in the northern Spain in the city of Valladolid with all of this polychrome sculpture. Much of it is kept, and it's, it's worth a trip to see because it's uh, imagery that has tremendous devotional uh, quality to it. As a matter of fact, as we'll discuss later on, this Baroque uh, art informed Catholic art really up from the end of the Baroque in the 18th century up through, now the Baroque art is the art we've probably grown up with in our churches. These are the holy cards we see. Uh, it's a very fine, it's got this sort of S-curve of the life force, but I mean it is hanging gravity, it is life and death juxtaposed. Next please. This is Martinez Montañez's uh, monumental crucifix. This is an archive picture I got from the uh, Chapel of Seville, because it was not in the chapel when I was there in 1992. It was in the Vatican Exposition because it was the World's Fair, and I, I d couldn't get a picture of it. But it's one of the, one of the greatest crucifixes of all time. Uh, Martinez Montañez was, was a, a, obviously a man of spirit because he uh, sculpted this, uh, this falling Christ, uh, but not quite fallen because he, being a man of obedience, when the cabildo, the uh, chapter of the, uh, of the uh, cathedral, asked him to uh, sculpt this, they said, they told him what they wanted. I mean, Catholic artists do what the priests tell them to do. It's obedience, part of our Christian, I mean, uh, uh, concept, our Catholic concept of obedience. So they wanted him to paint this, uh, to sculpt this, but with the eyes still open just before death, so that whoever is kneeling before this image in prayer can have a rapport, just a little bit of a seeing Jesus and talk to Jesus and try to empathize with Jesus just before he dies. It's a wonderful idea and perhaps God gave him an inspiration and a grace to do by following what he was supposed to do, by following orders and being obedient. Probably the most beautiful uh, Baroque crucifix I mean ever done. I'm sorry, this uh, does not quite show it, but um, the hands, the feet, uh, these are worthy, I mean, of Michelangelo or any of these great Renaissance sculptures. It's a magnificent work. Next, please. The uh, Immaculata, I mean, of Pedro de Mena. This is an, an, another of these archetypal uh, figures of the Baroque, Mary as the Purissima, the, the Immaculate Conception. She's always standing on the moon, it's upside down here. But Mary uh, rising up, and there's a tremendous Marian devotion. Remember, this is another one of the things that was attacked by the bourgeois culture. The sacraments, the saints, uh, the authority of Rome, and the devotion, the veneration, not adoration of, of Mary. Uh, still the blue of the uh, iconographic. It's, it's turned green with age. Uh, next, please. The, the uh, Dolorosa, another of the uh, typical images of the Renaissance, the grieving mother all through um, Spain and Latin America, you're going to find this image in every church, the suffering mother of God. It is, again, excuse me, not the celestial Venus of the Neoplatonists, but it is this image of through your own heart a sword will pass. This identification of Mary with the suffering of Christ, of her son, that we do not worship Mary. Mary is our in intermediary because she is fully human like us and she is a mother. 
She's a real mother, mother to us. As, Saint, as our Lord said to St. John, here's your mother, mother, here's your son. And all of us in the Catholic tradition are her children. So Mary here gains her identity through her suffering with her son. Next, please. This is uh, Gregorio Fernandez is St. Bruno. Uh, not that St. Bruno I mean, has any specific uh, significance in the Baroque, but it's Fernandez, another one of these great sculptors I mean, of the Baroque, who c captured in a way this concept of sanctity and could get this tremendous resignation, asceticism, and enthusiasm for, for what he was doing in a face. And the face of a very ordinary looking man. It's not a, a Byzantine archetype where the eyes are enlarged, the nose is thin. This is a very ordinary human being uh, who is infused with grace. It's not the ignudi of Michelangelo where you had a perfect body is the reflection of a perfect soul. No, we're all born the way we are. Our bodies are not going to change if we are infused with grace, if we receive the sacraments. Uh, well, our expression may change, but our actual physiognomy is not going to change. Next, please. The Immaculata, again, this is uh, Zur Baran's tremendous icon of the uh, Baroque period. We see them all over. This is the vision of Mary that comes into us. We've seen them in our holy cards and in our schools, everywhere. This vision of Mary, the Immaculate Conception, uh, which is declared, of course, I mean, a uh, a dogma of the church only recently under, under Pius XII, 1950. But this, in the, in the Baroque, this is, was a popular devotion. This, this, these devotions that come up, these were re emphasis in the Baroque period after the Council of Trent. Not inventions of the Council of Trent, but the tradition of the church, a reinforcement and a restatement of the Immaculate Conception, the Eucharist, uh, the primacy of Peter, all of these things, and in, they all come out in art. Next, please. Uh, Zurbaran, again, the, the monastic order, he has this one, he's painted all of these, these uh, he's considered the painter of the monastic life, and they are beautiful, beautiful paintings, always this great whiteness uh, of the purity of, the, uh, of light coming in, uh, to in to show that grace is being all constantly pouring into nature if it's received in the, in the proper uh, frame of mind. Next, please. Again, the Immaculate Conception, this is the Murillo, uh, that we all know and love. I mean, this is, this is the icon of the, the Baroque. Mary uh, crown, uh, on, bathed in the sun, crowned with the 12 stars, uh, standing on the moon. The moon, remember, is a feminine principle uh, in the sky. There's the sun, the moon. Uh, Mary, standing, Mary is the feminine principle, that she is the mother. She is the one to whom we must turn for maternal love and devotion. God is God. Mary is mother father and mother. There's God is not father and mother. If God is father and mother, who is Mary? Mary is the creature elevated by God, as we saw in Bosco's dream earlier, elevated by God to a level where there can be a, a relationship between God and creature, surrounded by angels. These, uh, one little anecdote here, well, sometimes one wonders why these little cherubs here, I mean the angels in, in the Baroque are either just tiny little heads with wings, that, that means divine intelligences, they have no bodies, or little tiny uh, naked uh, puti, they're called little uh, bambini, uh, and this is to show the innocence of the angels, um, a different concept of how to paint an angel. Wonderful food for thought. How do you paint angels who have no bodies? Next, please. To get into the architecture of the Baroque, here we have Santiago de Compostela, originally a Romanesque church. It is given this filigree, just as Bernini did to St. Peter's, to make it more, look more natural. Next, please. This uh, Baroque style is not just I mean, something of the cities and of the intellectuals. It's something that flows right down into the uh, pueblos, I mean, the, into the little towns. Here we have the, uh, a little church. I don't remember where I took this picture of this beautiful little Baroque church, I mean, in a village church. Next, please. Uh, here in the north of Spain, we find the great gilded interiors we're going to see. And it always, uh, the, the Tremendous infinity of uh, design, but infused gold light, reflecting the light back down, uh, infused with light. Nature is infused with grace. Next, please. The grace does not come from within. Uh, Mary is always seen as the center of these 
pictures of nature. Mary is the perfection of creation. Next, please. Uh, again, a coronation of Mary. I'm just going to run through some of these, uh, all of these different chapels in Spain of this, these gilded interiors, which I mean, the Protestants don't understand. They hate them. That it is this gold, reflect gold is perfection, is reflecting the, God's light back down. Next, please. These are heavenly visions. Mary crowned again as the queen of nature. Always in these Baroque altarpieces, you'll have Mary, queen of nature. Next, please. Mary again crowned queen of nature. Next, please. The, when this moves to uh, South America, remember the church was brought through over to South America, and the evangelization of the, of the Indians there, as they were not intelligent, was all done with pictures. Instead of bringing books, as the Protestants did, the missionaries, Franciscan, uh, Jesuit, Augustinian, they came with the, what they call the estampitas, the little holy cards. We still had those in my day growing up. The holy cards were a very important part of our Catholic life. So through the pictures, they would get to the people. So the Baroque, these curves, Mary, Queen of Nature above here, over St. Joseph and the Child. Next, please. Uh, from Quito, Ecuador, the, <coughs> this, you know, the Church of the Compañía, I believe it's Quito, uh, Saint Ign uh, the Ignatian spirit, the Jesuits. Uh, it's a very much of an indigenous style with lots of little filigrees here. Look, it's obviously an Indian uh, thing, but it's the same idea of nature. And this time it's crowned by the infant Jesus. Uh, but it's this whole idea of nature with the centralized figure of Jesus or Mary. Next, please. We see the same interiors in, in, uh, in South America, in Mexico City, for example, the Solomonic Columns, Christ crucified, and then Mary uh, up here uh, over nature. But the center of, of, the, uh, of this uh, altarpiece for a tableau is the crucified Christ. Next, please. Okay. This perhaps is the most beautiful of all the colonial churches, Nuestra Señora de Rosario, Our Lady of Our Rosary in Puebla, Mexico, where the Pope uh, had his conference. Probably one of the reasons is that this is kind of a, a pilgrimage center. It's, this is looking back towards the end of the church, this tremendous feeling. Oh, it is almost infinite variety here of these curls of nature bathed in light, as we'll see in a second from the cupola. Next, please. This is looking towards the altar, and of course we have Our Lady of the Rosary enshrined in, there in her ornacina, a little glass case, and surrounded by saints, surrounded by adoring cherubs, uh, all of the uh, filigrees, all gilded by hand, 24 karat gold, very thin, placed over all of the woodwork. We see the light coming down from here above, bathing this again in the light of grace, which reflects off the gold, illuminating, making all a paradise on earth of grace in nature, working through nature. Can be rejected also. Next, please. This is the dome of that church. As we saw in Byzantium, they put Christ the Pantocrator, the Lord of all, up there. In this church, we have the Holy Spirit at the dome of the church. Again, Godhead at the top. We look up towards God, the light coming through, uh, the light of the Spirit bathing the church. Uh, and we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, prudence, fortitude, etc. Uh, uh, wisdom, learning, excuse me, <laughs> the virtues. No, these are the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, around surrounding the Holy Spirit up here. Wisdom, understanding, uh, fear of God. Next, please. This is another church to Our Lady of the Rosary in, in Ecuador. Uh, the same idea, the gilded nature, Our Lady at the center of creation on her crescent moon. Next, please. Uh, the painting, these are from Bolivia. This is, uh, St. James Mat Santiago Matamoros. It is the idea of the conquest that the Spanish were, it is a conquest, it's a conquest of the soul. Next, please. From Bolivia, again, the same idea, it's not a Montagnes, but the Ignatian idea of put yourself at the scene, these statues and pictures help us to put us into this terrible moment of the flagellation of Christ. Next, please. The tremendous devotion to the Eucharist. Again, in Bolivia, this monstrance here and the processions of Corpus Christi, the, uh, the Feast of uh, Christ uh, in the Eucharist that still carries on in South America and in Spain. Next, please. The coronation of the Virgin, the Trinity, the Blessed Mother. Primitive paintings, perhaps, but the, these are done not 
to be great works of art, though they are, but to edify the faithful. Next, please. Uh, a guardian angel. Another very Catholic idea promoted in the arts. Next, please. Now, all of this came to an end with the French Revolution. As we know, Mary was replaced by Marianne with her hat. Uh, Baroque culture came to an end with this destruction of the uh, Spanish Armada by the English. In France, it was destroyed in the Revolution. Next, please. Here we see uh, Goya's, I mean, famous pic uh, picture of the Fusilamento, the firing squad at the Moncloa, the Franciscan. Uh, the Catholic culture in, uh, ended, it didn't end, but it was under tremendous assault at this time. Next, please. Uh, Aurora, the goddess of dawn by Otto Rung, a whole new age concept is to build new chapels to nature. Next, please. Uh, the, the Baroque tradition continues in Spain, this is, uh, and the South American countries, these, these, these statues are taken out in procession. This is Our Lady of Sorrows again, this is what's called a, a brotherhood, a cofradía, who takes these statues out in Holy Week. I'm a member of the cofradía of this particular virgin, and I've gone out on Good Friday in sackcloth behind her. Uh, it's a Spanish tradition, and these images are carried through the streets. Next, please. That is not a, a great work of art. This is the statue by Mena, one of the great artists, still paraded in Holy Week on Good Friday. Uh, the, the people go in procession. It goes through all the streets and, uh, of the city, and people fall on their knees. As, as I've walked in these processions, you hear, I mean, uh, people of high station, I mean, in, in furs, and not, not furs, but in jewels, I mean, in beautifully dressed, fall on their knees, as you see, I mean, gypsies and rogues and renegades, as the statues of the redemption go on by, Christ and his blessed mother, the Dolores, go by, they, uh, they uh, pardon me, please. And it may, for some, it's their only contact with, with religion during the whole, whole year. They're unchurched, the unchurched mass, but the, during Holy Week, they're in, they're in penance, asking for the pardon of our Lord. Next, please. Now, just as the Byzantine art in Constantinople carried on in the Orthodox Church today was frozen in time, so to speak, by the Second Council of Nicaea in 787, uh, this Pantocrator we saw before from Constantinople, the heavenly vision. Uh, next, please. The Immaculate Conception, this icon of the Roman Church that we all have grown up with, frozen in time somewhat at the Council of Trent and 1548. Art, the Catholic art has not come, there has been no Catholic movement of art general. There have been Catholic artists, individuals, who have done great work. Uh, as an epical, as a manifestation of the church itself, there has been no art until a uh, movement that has replaced this Baroque or the Orthodox iconography. These are the two, Baroque and the, uh, on the icon, that have come down to us now. Now, I would like to end this series looking toward the future. Uh, this is the eighth and final uh, slideshow. We've had a council, a Second Vatican Council, and we also have a pope who is very much interested in bringing the Eastern and Western churches together. Uh, let us not pray that by this, if there could be this fusion of the Orthodox iconography and the Baroque love of life, could there not be then in the 21st century, as the pope wishes, a rebirth of Catholic culture, Catholic art, and just a rebirth of the love of Christ and the love of his world and the love of his church. Thank you very much. <laughs>